Adam Ku is perhaps uh, one of the first people very, very outside the traditional industry whom I'm starting to speak to because I want to get a sense of how the industry is evolving from people who are not beholden to the current structures of banks and insurance companies and fund managers and wealth managers and private banks um, who are <laughs> there to sell products and services to customers. Adam, thank you very much for doing this chat with me and welcome to uh, Radio Finance. So let's start by getting a perspective on who you are. I've been an entrepreneur all my life. So I started my first business when I was in school um, in those days in the, in the 90s, right? It was the mobile disco business. And during that time, I also had a passion for, uh, you know, teaching because I was a wayward kid. I was an underachiever and I went to one of these motivational programs back in the 80s. And that really changed my life by changing my belief system. And I was very inspired by, by that guru, that speaker. And so I started to read all about, you know, the psychology of positive thinking and NLP and all that stuff. And that's how I first started by going out there and inspiring children, inspiring kids on how to study, how to succeed in life. Um, and then I started doing a lot of corporate training uh, when I graduated from university. So my focus was actually in the insurance business. So um, in those days, um, I used to do training for AIA, Prudential, Great Eastern, you name it, all the big insurance companies. I train the insurance people in self-motivation, in sales, as well as I have to recruit a lot of the financial planners during that time. And later on, I began to go into teaching people how to invest because that has always been one of my passions. Um, my background is actually in finance uh, from NUS Business School. I first started investing at about 17, 18 years old. Now, back then, there was no internet. So I, basically, for the first eight years, I, I did, I made all the stupid mistakes you can possibly make, make as an investor. I had no idea about how to value companies, no idea about fundamentals. You know, I bought basically based on rumors, based on tips by the brokers, lost a lot of money. But the thing about it was I never gave up. And that motivated me even more to say, I have to master this stuff because I really want to be able to grow my wealth in a sustainable and consistent way. So I started to invest a lot in my education. I read every possible book I could find on finance, on investing. And I, I read through all the different uh, schools of thoughts, right? From value investing to growth investing to trading. Um, and the methodology that really resonated with me initially was the Buffett uh, methodology. So a lot of my investing approach is really grounded uh, in value growth investing. And moving on from that, I started to read a lot about technical analysis. I went a lot into trading techniques as well. I started uh, teaching investing back in 2005, where I created this program called Wealth Academy. And it was only very recently, which was 2016, that I started to put my teachings online, starting with YouTube. And I never... I had no idea how well it's going to be received. In fact, when I first went on YouTube, people told me, you know, why would they listen to you? So we've got like 26 million views, 600,000 subscribers. So we're definitely in the top five of uh, investment channels in the world. One of the things that I think made me different from the thousands of gurus out there was, was number one, I, I gave uh, a lot of content on my free video. My belief is that if the free videos, I give them so much value, and even from the free videos, they could get results, then they'll be thinking, if the free stuff is so good, what about the paid stuff, right? And it worked. The second thing that makes it different, like I'm one of the few guys that actually shows my account online. And I don't just show them my live account, I actually print out reports from my broker, quarterly and annual performance reports, and that has inspired my students to do the same. The third quality about you, um, which I thought uh, distinguishes you from a lot of the other uh, investment gurus um, was that you're actually um, a business owner. Um, and, and I like the moments when you describe your, your trading, not as a gambling or a uh, investing or just um, you know, making a bet on the future, but as a business. And running business requires a discipline. 
Uh, and I think that came across very well um, in y- you as an investment teacher, you know, and, and you described it as a normal P&L, a profit and a loss statement, um, you know, that any business owner will go do. And that's something I res- resonated with. You're not just taking the next idea and trying to make the most of it. Give us a sense of that. I do both investing and trading. 80% of my portfolio is investing and 20% is in trading. And I liken it a bit to relationships. So investing is kind of like getting married. Now, when you marry someone, you want a person with good fundamentals, good character, good heart, intelligent, loving person, right? So when you invest, it's 90% fundamentals, okay? And 10% are the technicals, which is the trend, the current trend of the market. Now, trading is like a one-night stand. In trading or one night stands, you don't care about a person's character. So same thing with short-term trading. It's 90% technicals and uh, 10% fundamentals. So the difference is in trading, you go in and out very fast. Now, I don't do day trading. I do more like swing trading where I hold the trade for a few weeks. But in trading, you use a stop loss. By investing, you don't use a stop loss because you know it's a great company. And the lower the price drops, the more you accumulate. But when it comes to investing, one of my rules is that I only invest in in the fundamentally strongest businesses in the market. And out of all the stocks in the US, there are about 4,000 listed companies in the US. Less than 1% of them pass my criteria. I only invest in companies with a solid track record. Okay, So the companies must have consistent growth in sales revenue, net income and cash flow from operations and free cash flow. That first criteria alone will eliminate 95% of businesses out there. Okay. Now, Tesla does not have consistent free cash flow growth. So I, I, I'll never invest in, an, in a Tesla. And why? Because when there's a bear market, when there's a big correction, guess what? These are the stocks that are going to collect 20, 30, 40, 50% because they are what we call like fairy dust, you know, unicorn stocks. But when you have a, a business like whether it's an Amazon or Facebook or Microsoft, where they have the, the, the dividend yield to support the share price. They got a free cash flow to support the share price. They got high cash, got very low conservative debt. These are the ones that are resilient, that will hold their own in, in corrections and bear markets. And these are the only ones I invest in. Step two is I only invest in companies with a sustainable competitive advantage that protects it from potential competition, which Warren Buffett calls it the economic moat. So what creates a moat would be, example, a brand monopoly. Where this conservatism and and this uh, structure comes in your investment um, personality. I've always been conservative, actually. And people are very curious. They say, Adam, if you're such a conservative person, why did you become an entrepreneur? Why didn't you work for someone? And the reason I became an entrepreneur was because I felt that being an entrepreneur was safer and more secure than working for someone. Because I felt that if I work for someone, they are in control of my destiny. And I feel very insecure when that happens, that I can get fired anytime, that, you know, I could, I could be replaced by someone younger, cheaper, faster than me. And, but I felt that if I'm an entrepreneur, I'm in control. No one can fire me, right? So ironically, it was my conservative nature that got me to always be an entrepreneur. You've got thousands of students and you've got students who actually work in banks. I'm curious to know um, some of the things that your students have talked to you about or asked you and, and had conversations with you. What is it that you know that someone in a finance degree doesn't know? I actually wanted to do a CFA a couple of years ago and I... I gave up halfway. You know, I, the reason was because I found that a lot of the things I was learning in the CFA course were not relevant and not things I was interested in. So in the end, I bought all the CFA books. I only read those sections that interest me. But having said that, I, now, I'm not knocking business. I found that the content was good, but it was not practical, not relevant to real life making money. I approach the market as a supermarket of companies where companies are on sale every day at different prices. And I focus on the fundamentals of the individual businesses. And I don't care about the macro stuff at all. If you buy great businesses that dominate their industries, 
and you buy them when they're selling at a discount. That's all you need. And have the patience to hold them through the short-term fluctuations of the market, you will do well. A great business is one that will increase in value over time. It's as simple as that. Okay. Now, so the people who come to you, some of them have this techno technical knowledge. What is so revealing? About what I found over the years is that sometimes people who come to my program with zero financial knowledge, the premise of economics is that people make rational decisions, correct? But in reality, people don't make rational decisions. The market in the short term is not driven by logic. It's driven by emotions. Okay. And the trouble with a lot of these people who are trained in finance is that they have the technical knowledge but they lack the psychology. So when the market is going down 20, 30, 40, 50% or 36% back in Feb, right? That's the time that I get excited, right? I wake up, all right, and start buying like crazy, you know? But, right. you know, people may have that, 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 that logical knowledge, but they freeze in fear. A number of viewers uh, on this, in this live session uh, are actually curious to know, what do you make of today's market? There's so much excitement uh, and, and uh, wonderment in, in terms of, um, you know, what is it that we are facing? How do I protect my wealth in, in this changing world? You know, do, is there something that I need to invest in to, uh, to maximize it or protect it? Uh, or should I just be cautious? When you buy a business? stock, you're not buying a lottery ticket, okay? And no one can predict where the market is going. No one knows where the market will be in one day, one week, one month. No one knows. No one can predict. Everyone's guessing. No one knows where the market is going. All we know is that over time, the market will always go up. And you've got to know that once a year, the market will drop at least 5%, historically. Once every two years, it will drop at least 10%. Once every five years, it will drop at least 20%. We call it a bear market. Okay, now when will that happen? No one knows. Okay, so just right. know that the market over time, in terms of the, the index, will always rise. In the short term, it will drop once in a while. And okay. those times when it drops are times when it's an opportunity to accumulate shares of great businesses. The main focus, like I said, is when you buy a stock, you're buying a piece of a business. So focus on the business. Okay, now to answer your first question, where, where do I invest and where do I see the market? Now, for me, I've got basically two main investment portfolios, okay? The first is my capital gain portfolio, and the second is my dividend portfolio. When it comes to capital gains, I only focus on US and China, that's it. To me, that's all I need. Because US and China have the best secular growth companies, okay? And... Like I, and in the US, like I said, out of the 4,000 companies, less than 1% of them are in my watch list. So these are companies with, again, consistent free cash flow, low debt, and they dominate their respective industries. <clears throat> so I tell investors that, you, at the very least, look at the MAGAF stocks. M-A-G-A-F, MAGAF, right? Microsoft, Amazon, Google, Alphabet, uh, Apple, and Facebook. Because the MAGAF stocks, they dominate their respective industries that are changing our lives, that all of us use. People classify them as tech stocks. I don't. To me, it doesn't make sense calling them tech stocks. If you call them tech stocks, let me tell you, in the, in the, in the near future, every stock is a tech stock. So for me, is Amazon a tech stock? No, Amazon is not a tech stock. It is a retail company. It's an e-commerce retail company. Right? Google Alphabet is not a tech stock. It is a communications company. So you got to think very differently that, that, that way, right? And to me, you should only invest in a company only if there's value and growth. It, it, it should not be either or. It should be both. Okay? So for example, if you look at Amazon, Amazon has growth. Okay? So how do you define growth? Growth means it's growing at, say, at least like 20% a year. And it's in a secular growth industry, not a cyclical growth industry. And there are times when Amazon gets to be at value, undervalued. So it's how you value companies. The trouble with a lot of people is they don't understand how to value companies. Like many people, they look at Amazon and they say, Amazon's expensive. They say, it's $3,000. I say, you can't value it based on the absolute price. 
Now, a $3,000 stock can be cheap and a penny stock can be expensive. Whether it's cheap or expensive depends on the price versus its underlying intrinsic value. Part number two, some people, they look at P-E ratio and say, hey, Amazon's P-E is 80 times. That's crazy. But that's very misleading because P-E ratio is share price divided by earnings. Okay. But you got to understand that a, a company, Amazon, their earnings are purposely depressed because of high depreciation. So you've got to dig into the financials. The people who are watching this session, for example, are traditional bankers and, and uh, traditional fund managers and so on. And they're looking at you and saying, how can this guy who runs his own business uh, be as good as what we do, you know, and, 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 and take, you know, clients away from us and, and so on. Um, what I think impressed me is uh, you need to know what you're going to be invest in, investing in uh, long before you're invested in it. The second thing that I think came across in what you're trying to say is that there's actually you, 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 you're a good time, bad time guy. That means that um, you're invested in the good times and the bad times. And that's why I liked uh, what, the way you looked at investment because uh, it is a uh, it is a continuous source of investment uh, income for you, regardless of how the market is, right? Uh, is, I mean, it depends on how you define uh, good time and bad time. I don't look at the market as going down is bad, going up is good. In fact, you have to rewire your mind to think very differently. So to me, when the market is in a correction, right? The market is down 20, 30, 40%. To me, it's good, right? That's when I start to deploy a lot of cash. In fact, in February, I was like 100% into equities. But as the market goes up and things get more and more overvalued, I start to raise cash. I start to sell to raise cash and I may then hold 20, 30% cash. So you're right, I'm always invested. So when the markets are very undervalued, yeah, you want to be fully in, like maybe 90% in equities, right? But when the market's overvalued, then maybe you're like, you know, 50, 60% in equities and the rest in cash, waiting to redeploy when things get cheap again. Do you make a lot of money from your training programs? Isn't, isn't that a source of income as well? Of course, definitely, yeah. We make a lot of money in training programs as well. But the great thing about me teaching investing is that when I teach you how I trade and how I invest, and you make a lot of money, you don't become my competitor because when you make more, I don't make less, right? Because the financial markets are so big. So the great thing is I can teach you how I trade. You make money, I also make money, and I make money by teaching you when you look at traditional banks or traditional fund managers or uh, securities companies or traders uh, being your competitor, um, yeah. what is it that you offer that they don't? And the traditional way in which wealth management is being sold today, um, what's the good and bad about it? I don't see them as my comp competitors at all. I don't, I don't think they see me as their competitors because I think we serve a different niche in a way. So I'll give you an example right now. Not everyone is interested to learn how to invest and to trade. Not everyone, honestly, all right? And not everyone is willing to put in the time and the work to do it, you know? And I tell you that it takes time, it takes hard work. So if you're not willing to do that, go and get the bank to, to manage your investments. But understand that if you do that, you'll get lower returns, which is fair, because if they're doing the work, they deserve to be paid their fees, okay. all right? But then there are some people who say, no, I'm willing to do it myself. I want to learn. That's where I come in and I teach you. Okay? okay. And of course, if you do that, you can make a lot higher returns than going to buying traditional banking products. Why? Because you do it yourself. You obviously deserve to get higher returns because you save a lot on fees. What are you seeing in terms of trends? Like who are the people coming to your classes now? Increasingly, okay. what is the, how's the profile been changing? <laughs> Roughly about half the people who come uh, have never bought stocks before. They may have bought some unit trusts in the past or some unit link products, but never bought stocks themselves, right? 50%. And the reason they come is because they want to get a higher return from their investments. Because if you buy traditional banking products or unit link policies, you're getting what, three, four, five percent a year? The other half of the people who come to my program, they have invested before. And of course, half of those people who have invested before have lost money because they have no idea what the heck they were doing. And I tell people that, if you invest in a market without having the education, it's like driving a car without going to driving school. It's only a matter of time you're going to get hurt financially. So you've got to learn how to drive defensively, follow the traffic lights, seatbelt, airbags, and all that. And then investing becomes very, very safe. Then 
the other half of the half have invested before and have made money, but they are not turned on have that high returns. They're getting single digit returns and they want to come to learn how to double or triple that in a sustainable way. And increasingly, I get more and more professionals. Recently, for some reason, I've got a lot of bankers joining my program. All right, a lot of private bankers, uh, stockbrokers, financial planners coming because they want to know, you know, how, how I do it. The questions coming through the, you know, the, the, the chat right now is, how do I make sense of what the market is today? Today, you know, uh, what can I learn? What should I know? And in fact, what you're saying is the professionals are asking the same question as well. I think the problem is a lot of people are asking the wrong question. That's what they want to know. Where's the market going a day from now, a week from now, a month? And you're That's not the listening wrong question to what your no one answer knows. Is. No one knows where the heck the market is going. The right question to ask is what are the best businesses to buy that are in secular growth industries that uh, that are selling at a reasonable price? That's, that's the right question to buy. So when people ask me, okay, is the market overvalued? Right? It's a very general question. Now, in general, yes, the market is overvalued if you look at it in terms of the S&P's price-to-earnings ratio. But if you drill down to individual companies and learn to value the individual companies, there are companies that still offer value. I look at businesses as I classify them under different categories. You need to have a balanced portfolio. So, for example, a big part of my portfolio are in, again, secular growth companies. Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, secular growth companies. Now, these companies are not high growth. They don't grow at 20, 30%. They grow at maybe 8, 10%. But they are very defensive companies. Then I've got another group of companies. I call them the deep cyclicals. Now, in general, I don't like to touch cyclical companies. Okay, in general. But the only cyclical companies I would touch are banks. Now, now having said that, there are only five banks I'll ever buy in the world. UOB, OCBC, DBS, JP Morgan, Bank of America. That's all I'm going to buy. And I only buy cyclicals when they are selling near the bottom of the cycle. So I look at the historical price to book ratio. I only accumulate when they are near the historical low of the price to book. And of course, and then at the top of the cycle, I, I get rid of cyclicals. All right. Then another group of companies are speculative growth. So these are the ones that, you know, high revenue growth, but not making money yet. These are the ones that I tend to be very careful with. I don't really invest in them, but I may trade them for the short term. Okay, because they tend to be a lot more overvalued. Okay, and then, of course, we've got turnaround plays. Turnarounds are like, you know, Boeing, right? Where great business, but temporarily losing money because of short-term issues. And these are the companies where you want some allocation, but not too much because they are more risky. So whether you buy a stock depends on your portfolio objectives, your portfolio allocation. You can't just ask, is this the right stock to buy? You're an investment teacher. What is your portfolio outside of investments? Like, do you have uh, property? What do you consider as being your total portfolio? I wish I could invest in property. I wish, but I can't because of the, the additional buyer stamp duty. So stick within your circle of competence. You, you want to buy companies that are resilient regardless of the short-term economic situation, right? So, I mean, during the pandemic, Apple's sales increase, Microsoft sales increase. So you want these businesses that are pandemic-proof, that are not okay. affected by short-term cycles. You, you want these companies to be a big part of your portfolio. So there are certain industries, example, I will never invest in. Example, I'll never touch airlines because airlines, even before the pandemic, are very price competitive. I don't touch auto manufacturers. I don't touch uh, commodity companies. I don't touch real estate developers because those businesses are very, um, they're very competitive. Right. And very cyclical, okay. which, which I don't right. like. You know? You're a lot into options. And, and I, yeah. I guess almost every mature <clears throat> investment guru talks about options uh, because uh, investing in equities directly is a cost, a capital cost. Um, you know, to, to, to the investor. Uh, whereas an option is more like a, a, an insurance sort of to, to get in and out as you like. And that's how I would describe it, but you might describe it uh, differently. Um, yeah. uh, you know, for, for the sake of completeness, okay, options, just a very quick com comment on that. Whether you are an investor or trader, um, to me, you have to learn options because options allow you to increase your ROI, lower your cost, 
and lower the capital required if you know what you're doing. You gotta know what you're doing. So options are like a nuclear weapon. If you know how to use it properly, you dominate the world, right? But if you don't know how to use it properly, it can blow up in your face, okay? So I, I share with you a very simple way in which I use options in my investments. Uh, one of the simplest things I do is to sell uh, cash secured put options on fundamentally great businesses. So for example, Apple is now at $120. I bought it at about $120. I sold it at $450. I more than triple money. I've sold all my Apple shares, but I want to get back in. <laughs> but after the share split, right now Apple's at $120. My valuation is about $85. So I'll only buy Apple below $85. I'm not going to buy it above that. Now I can wait for Apple to go below 85 until it gets there. So instead of waiting, what I do is, now that Apple's at 120, I'm selling put options at 85, okay? So when you sell a put option, what does it mean? It means that by selling a put option at 85, I'm obligated to buy Apple shares if Apple shares go below, below 85 by the expiration of the options, okay? So, and by selling the put option, I collect premium. And the premium averages about 2% a month. So 2% a month is 24% a year. So my point is this, if Apple drops below 85, by expiration, I'm forced to buy Apple shares at 85, which is what I want to do anyway, all right? But if Apple doesn't drop below 85, I don't get to buy the shares, the options become worthless, but I keep my 2% premium. So basically, that's what I do every month. I just keep selling put options at very big discounts of companies I want to own, and 99% of the time, my options never get exercised, all right? They all expire worthless. And just by doing that, my portfolio gains at least 20 to 30% a year just by selling those done options. And, and so you don't see your options purchase as a, a investment loss. You see it as a cost. A lot of people, when they start with options, they start by buying options. They use options as a speculative tool. I don't do that. Why? Remember, 90% of options expire worthless. When you buy an option to bet on the direction of the stock, you're only going to be right less than half the time because options are decaying asset, right? Time works against you. Your, you know, theta is negative, right? I make most of my money by selling options. I'm a net option seller. So I benefit from the decay of the options. Right. That, that's, that's the big difference. So I don't buy insurance. I sell insurance in the market. That was my conversation with Adam Ku, uh, a very well-known uh, investment teacher uh, in Southeast Asia and a lot of uh, different Asian countries. It is my own journey in trying to talk to people who are outside of traditional financial services, not the bankers, not the fund managers, not the private bankers and so on, but the people who are helping uh, large numbers of ordinary people out there to manage their own finances. I was hoping to uh, gain an insight on how uh, people like Adam Koo might well be transforming the financial services industry. But what I've learned uh, is that uh, these are people who are democratizing uh, an understanding of wealth management. And in democratizing the process, the disciplines that, that leapt out at me as Adam was speaking uh, included the fact that all of us uh, need to have an education in investment from a very young age. Number two, that each of us have to uh, start understanding the assets that we are investing in, make the mistakes, uh, learn from them, and then hone the skills over time. Uh, number three, uh, there is no alternative but to go down to fundamentals um, of a business. So you don't think of investment as a opportunity to get rich quickly, but an opportunity, uh, it, it, it involves the same disciplines as if you were working uh, every day uh, and, and incurring a cost to get to work on time and so on. Uh, and then from there um, to be able to generate an income that you then accumulate, which becomes wealth over time. So having, had uh, a good sense of the disciplines that an investment teacher has in place now helps me to tie it back to what traditional financial institutions are doing or should be doing uh, to help that process of helping as many people understand their financial needs uh, over time. And, and as Adam 
uh, appropriately answered to the question of uh, how do I make a quick buck in today's market? The answer is that you're asking the wrong question. Um, so many of you may be aware that as I get into conversations like this, I'm not just talking to uh, you know, people in the industry, but becoming wider and broader in my scope uh, in the quest to answer questions that are in my own mind. So if you're following me in my interviews, uh, you're actually following me on a journey where you may not understand why I may have picked up someone like Adam to be interviewed, and I will pick out other people like him over time, but they're all uh, adding up to my idea of how finance as an industry will evolve, but also how history itself is evolving and how entire economies uh, will, will develop over time and how all of us as individuals uh, need to take stock of what uh, our own discipline should be in, in preserving our wealth, growing it, um, and, and being responsible uh, for our own assets. So thank you very much and uh, join us again next time for another interview uh, with someone important like this.